from as well. About two years ago, we did a series called Uncomfortable Grace, and in this series, we, uh, I, I share with you a definition from Paul David Tripp, an author, and he writes uh, that uncomfortable grace is God wants to take you where you don't want to go to do in you something that could happen no other way. I like that definition. Uncomfortable grace is God would take you where you would not otherwise choose to go to produce something in you that you're not going to get any other way. And that's very appropriate in our current series, The Disciplines of Grace. Some disciplines of grace, like the last two weeks, are kind of fun. Generosity challenges, uh, I mean, uh, gratitude challenges. Who doesn't want to do that, you know? Be, get up and be thankful for things. Or think about noticing God. But other areas, particularly the area we're going to talk about this morning, generosity, is one where I think my, my observation is most people agree in principle that money, giving, generosity is a good thing. But when it gets a little personal, that's when we get our guard up. That's when we sort of withdraw. That's when we put up some barriers, especially in the church. Maybe you grew up in a church where it was all guilt all the time and it was obligation to give. We don't want to make people feel guilty or obligated. But, we, but it would be a huge omission if we don't talk about this. Here's why. If we're going to talk about disciplines of grace, what it means for a man or woman to grow in the grace of Jesus, to become more like him, to get free from the things that hold us back. How can we not talk about this? It's a big deal. It needs to be addressed. It's a big deal in the scriptures. Of the 38 parables, stories, spiritual stories Jesus told about life in the kingdom, 16 of them, almost half, had to do with wealth, resources, money, and generosity. One out of of every 10 verses in the gospels is about this issue. There are 500 verses on faith and 2,000 on money and generosity and our attitude toward it. So we just, can't, we just can't avoid it. If you're serious about becoming like Jesus, if you really mean it when you say, I want to be like him, then you cannot avoid this. Timothy Keller, author and pastor in New York City, writes um, in his book, Every Good Endeavor, about a man's work. He says, there can be no genuine spiritual growth unless your money and your attitude towards it are placed in God's hands. You can talk about all you want about the grace of Jesus Christ, but you really aren't going to grow. You're going to be stuck at a certain point unless your wealth and your attitude toward it are placed in God's hands. Over and over again in the New Testament, there's three things that pop up repeatedly as kind of like uh, the key litmus tests for how we know we're growing in grace. The first is your ability to forgive those who have wronged you. If you can't forgive, that's a pretty good indication that you're not growing in grace. If you hold on to wounds and can't let that go. Number two, your ability to serve. If you can't serve people that are in need or that are not like you, if you don't do that, that's a pretty good indication that you're not growing in grace. And the third, you can guess it even if it wasn't already up there, giving. Forgiving, serving, and generosity are the three things that show. You can talk about the grace of Jesus. You can believe intellectually in the grace of Jesus, but how do you know that you're getting it? Or that it's getting you. These are the three best indicators. Over and over again, Jesus talks about these three things. And so we need to talk about them as well. Think about it. If you went to your doctor and you said, doctor, I'm not feeling good. I'm not sleeping well. I get sick really easily. I have all kinds of aches and pains. I don't know what's wrong. Can you help me? Your doctor would rightly ask you, well, tell me about your sleep habits. Tell me about your diet. Tell me about your relationships. Tell me about your works and your stress life. What if you said, whoa, 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 doc, that's really personal. Back off. I just want to stick to the medical stuff. Just give me the pill, make me feel better. Your doctor would say, and rightly so, listen, I really can't help you unless we're gonna talk about these things because it's all connected, right? This is true spiritually. You can't say, I want more of God in my life, but I don't wanna talk about money. (laughs) It's all connected. It goes together. There are many passages we could choose from, but we're going to look at Paul's second letter to the Christians in the ancient city of Corinth. As I said, there's lots of passages. This is probably the, the chapter 8 and chapter 9 of 2 Corinthians is the longest kind of comprehensive teaching on generosity in the New Testament. Uh, let me give you a little background if you're new to the New Testament or in case you don't know much about the letter to Corinthians. Paul wrote two letters to these Christians living in Corinth. Corinth was a rival city to Athens. Most of you know about Athens. Athens was a wealthy port city. So was Corinth. There was a trade route. These were wealthy people. There was some house churches that had grown there that Paul had helped to start. He writes two letters to them to encourage them and to challenge them. We're going to look at the second letter. Uh, chapter 8, verses nine, 1 through 9. I've been saying I need glasses when I read, and today I brought them. <laughs> All right. 
Paul writes in chapter 8, We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. Accordingly, we urge Titus that, he, as he, that as he had started, so he should complete among you this act of grace. But as you excel in everything, in faith and speech and knowledge and all earnestness and in our love for you, see that you excel also in this act of grace. I say this not as a command to you, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love also is genuine. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. Two key characteristics here about the Corinthian church for you to get. One is, uh, I might need these again. One is uh, they're wealthy. I, I mentioned that. They're, they're upper middle class, wealthy, affluent. Two, they're mostly non-Jewish. They're Gentiles. They grew up not as Jews. They're pagan Gentiles who converted the faith in Jesus Christ. Now, Paul is writing to encourage them, but in these two chapters, he's actually, part of this letter is a fundraising letter. He's trying to raise money to help Christians living in Jerusalem who are starving because of a famine. So he's writing to rich, non-Jewish Christians in Greece to get them to give money to support poor Jewish Christians in Jerusalem. It's not an easy task. I want you rich Christians to give me money that I will share with poor people who you don't know and will likely never meet, who aren't even like you. That's what he's after. And he, you notice that he, in chapter 8 and 9, he never says, like, he doesn't guilt them. In fact, he even says, I'm not saying it's a command. And later in chapter 9, verse 7, he says, not under compulsion. This is a theme throughout the New Testament. Let's ask this question, where does generosity start? Where does it begin? Many of us make the mistake, I make this mistake of thinking, well, generosity begins when I get to a place where I can be generous. I've got some obligations, I've got some stresses, I've got to pay off this debt, I've got this loan, my kids are in college, I got, when I can get this point, then I could be generous. I understand that and I've lived that way, that's not what the New Testament says. It says generosity begins in your heart. Why doesn't Paul just say, look, you people are rich, they're starving, this is your Christian duty, so fork it over. <laughs> he doesn't say that. Because in God's eyes, generosity is entirely a matter of your heart. Think about it for a minute. What's the number? What's the, now I know I'm talking about numbers and giving. Some of you right now are squirming. You're very uncomfortable. That's probably case in point about why we need to deal with this. We already took the offering. Please don't misunderstand. I'm not trying to guilt anybody into giving to the church here. I want to talk to you about your heart, my heart, and growing in grace. How do you know if you're generous? What's the number at which you know this is the number at which I know that I'm generous? What's the number? There isn't one, is kind of the point. As soon as you put a line in the sand, what are you saying? You're saying, well, then I could, then I'm in the safe zone. Then I know I'm good with God. It's kind of like the, a version of what I used to be asked all the time when I was a youth pastor. Guys would ask, how far can I go with a girl? How far is too far before I'm you know, outside of God's plan for you know, sexual purity? It's the wrong question, guys. How, it's how can I encourage her to love Jesus more? So if we're asking, well, what's the number at which I know that I'm being generous? That was the wrong question. Some of you might be thinking, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, Pastor Jeff, there is a number. I know, I heard about it. It's called the tithe in the Old Testament. How many of you ever heard of the tithe? Tithe is a word that means a tenth. And it was a law in the Old Testament. God's people, the Israelites, the Jews of the Old Testament were required by law to give a tenth, a tithe of their first fruits to the work of God, to the temple, to the tabernacle, and to God's work in the, in, in, uh, to the poor. That was a, kind of a starting point for them, a tithe. Do you know how much the average uh, uh, ch American churchgoer gives today? At present company, of course, excluded, but just the, on average? It's not 10%, 2.5%, studies tell us. And Paul never mentions a tithe. He doesn't bring it up as a law. 
And Jesus actually, when he does bring it up, brings it up in terms of rebuking the Pharisees. He says in Luke chapter 11, he says, you, you tithe religiously, but you ignore justice and the love of God. So even the 10%, which I think the best way to, uh, if you're wondering, is the tithe required? I think the tithe is an assumed starting point for God's people in the New Testament. And the, then Jesus is saying, let's be generous beyond that. But most of us have a lot of growing to do, me included. So even that's not a line by which you could know if I just give that much, I'm in. It's still a matter of the heart. In fact, I want to, you know, we'll watch this little clip here from a website called Generous Living where some people outline, I think, really well, better than I could, where generosity starts and the heart behind a generous life. Let's watch this together. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That God so loved the world that he gave his son. That is such an overwhelming and humbling thought to me. Anything we have to give, we've received first. Because Jesus said, you know, freely have you received, now freely give. And so this whole sense of, you know, of completely being able to receive, can we then on the other side have the ability uh, to be generous? When I think about the God gave first and how, that, and how that affects my giving is, well, it's not mine. I mean, he gave it and he gave it to pass along. When I think about him, when I think about him giving it all up, it's like, how could I not be part of doing that with him out of worship and love to him? Since I love God and I want other people to know his love, the easiest way to do that is through giving. Because when you give a gift to someone, it's, it's like opening the door to their heart to then give them the ultimate gift of Jesus Christ. I really see how when he tells us to love him with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength and love our neighbors ourselves, when we do for others, it releases us from becoming self-focused and self-centered and self-indulgent. I marvel that he would allow me and, and would want to use me to help be a part of what he gives and how he gives. They said that very well. It begins in understanding who Jesus is and what he's given to us. So let me put it this way. There is an answer to the question, what's the line? How do you know? How much is required to know you're generous? Would you like to know how much? I could tell you right now. I, I, I have the pastor inside scoop on this one. Like, how do you know how much is, if you know you're generous? Would you like to know? Okay, I'll tell you. More. I know it's uncomfortable, isn't it? I don't mean give me more or give the church more. I mean, unless my heart is increasing in joyfulness and desire to be generous, that's a problem. That's the answer. I want to be like him. It doesn't say, for God so loved the world that he gave 10% and then that's enough for you people until you get your act together. He gave all himself for us. So, unless your attitude toward your money and giving is increasingly joyful and desiring to give more, then you're not truly generous. And the only way to be sure then is that you're not shrinking into, into self-centered greed is to be increasingly joyful in generosity. Let's talk about where generosity, how does it grow? Where does it start? It starts in your heart. How does it grow? Paul begins chapter 8 by giving them an example. Did you catch this example? He starts out that portion we read a moment ago. He says, I want you to know, brothers and sisters in Corinth, rich people in Corinth, about the grace of God given, notice he says the grace of God, given to the churches of Macedonia. Now the Macedonian churches were inland. They were not a port city. They were by comparison very poor compared to the Corinthians. These are poor people. So Paul is writing to rich people and saying, let me tell you about some poor people that you know, the Macedonians. They're also Greek, so they would know them or know of them, about the grace of God given to them. And he says, basically, he says, they gave joyfully, freely, abundantly, even out of their poverty. It's almost as if Paul was saying, I, I kind of tried to stop them, but they begged. He says they were begging for the opportunity to give. I've been a pastor a long time, been at this church 20 years. It doesn't happen very often people are begging to give. Sometimes it's the pastors who are doing the begging, right? And that doesn't work very well. It's fascinating. This is a picture of a generous heart. I want in on that. 
Like the guy in Vladia's uh, story, right? Becomes a Christian and says, something's happening here. Hold on, time out. Not my house, but your house. I want in on this. Well, what does that? Arm twisting, guilt from the pulpit? No. The grace of God in someone's heart for setting them free. This is a picture of generosity. Harvard economist Juliet Shore wrote a book called The Overspent American. It's really good. She says 70% of the households in the, in the U.S. that make more than $100,000 a year combined disagree with the following statement. I can buy everything I need. Think about that. The richest people in the richest country in the history of the world don't think they can buy what they need. The lie is to believe that we can start to be generous once we get to a certain point. It's the ever-receding horizon. It never comes. It's always out there. We never get there. Now, just like the Christians in ancient Corinth, I think those of us living in the affluent suburbs of Chicago, and you don't think of yourself as rich, and that's part of the lie, too, because you're comparing yourself to the wrong standard. We are. We, we need to take lessons and learn from some poorer Christians around us today. You, you heard a moment ago about some of the trips that are being taken, right? We have people serving right now in Ecuador, Mexico, just recently back. One of the reasons we send students to Mexico and to Ecuador and to Toronto and places like this is, is not just for the work they do. That's important. They do good work and it makes a difference. It's also so that they see the grace of God in people who have far less than they do. Because those students are going to come back here, I'm looking at some of them right now, are going to come back here and move into this community, go to college, get jobs, and become the halves of the world. The richest half of one half of 1%. If God can shake up their value system by going for a week to Ecuador and see people who have nothing and are joyful and generous in ways that they aren't, or we sometimes aren't, it can make lasting kingdom impact. Generosity grows out of our relationship with Jesus Christ. This is what we're after. My wife and I had the chance to go to Zambia to support one of our hospitals uh, and cure ministry, a hospital in Zambia, uh, an amazing trip. And part of our trip required us to stay for a, a layover overnight in Dubai. Anybody ever been to Dubai? It's the crazy, first of all, it's so hot, it's stupid. It's just ridiculous. You get off the plane, it's like a punch in the face. It's crazy hot. And it's like, it's like dry desert heat, plus it's near the Gulf, so it's like humidity too. It's like the worst of both. You know, anyway, then it's the desert. I mean, it's the desert. It's like Discovery Channel desert. There's nothing there. It's just sand. And then there's this city, this crazy, ridiculous, like futuristic city in the desert. Do you know how they built it? With oil money. Do you know why they built it? Because they could. Seriously, that's just because they could. And there's the Burj Khalifa, the tallest building in the world. And it, it's, it's not even, there's nothing really even in it. It's just a giant building. And they, they decided, they decide, well, we could build a bigger one. So now they have plans to build a, a taller one. You know why they're going to do that? Because they can. And then you fly from Dubai to Lusaka, Zambia, and you get off the plane, you take a five-hour Jeep ride to this hovel. It's a crazy world. The opulence, the wealth, and then you go and... And we, we, took, we went to church with the Tubalenge congregation way out in the bush in Zambia. And it was like this ridiculous bumpy and my spine was readjusted on the, on the ride out there. It was a two and a half hour service. 35 minutes of the service was the offering. I'm not kidding. 35 minutes of singing, dancing, praising. There was a big basket in the front and people came down the aisle waving their money around and, and you know, sacks of flour, whatever they were given, they put it in there and people, oh, praising and singing and pounding drums. I was like, what is going on? Oh, I thought we should try that next week. We're into that. So we're into, Woo! <laughs> it was all praise it's praising God for his generosity his provision it was beautiful and really humbling we want to be very private secretive don't talk about it it moved me deeply the reality is that generosity begins in the heart and it grows out of relationship to Jesus let me read a portion of chapter 9 this is the last half of this long teaching, two chapters on generosity. The Apostle Paul here is kind of concluding this section. And let me read verses 6 through 15. He's wrapping it up. He says, the point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he's decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, 
so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, he has distributed freely, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way, to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. By their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others. While they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you, thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. I hope you notice two things in that passage. Number one, Paul uses a metaphor throughout. He weaves in and out an agricultural metaphor. There's all these references to seeds and sowing and harvest. Did you catch that? And second, how many times does he refer to grace and the gospel? He's saying an agricultural metaphor about planting, sowing, and, and, and harvesting, and he's, he's connecting it constantly to the grace of Jesus. We'll try to unpack that briefly as we wrap up here. Generosity begins like a seed of grace planted in the human heart, and it grows over time as it's watered and nurtured in a relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm going to put it as plainly as I can for you, and if you're a note taker, write this one down. Your relationship with Jesus should change your relationship with your money. Your relationship with Jesus Christ should change your relationship to your stuff. If it doesn't, something's off in the relationship. The truth is that most of us attach our sense of identity and security to money or to what we think it can gain us. It's not that money is our God so much, but I have become convinced that what money does is it reveals to us our false God. It shows you your God. What do you spend freely on without thinking about it? No issue. No problem. One time, sometimes when I used to do premarital counseling for couples um, more frequently, we, I would ask them this question. I'd say, take this three by five card, write down on, without showing your, your fiance, how much is okay to spend when you're married without checking with your spouse? Write it down, turn it over, and on the count of three, turn, it, turn the card over. One, two, three. One time I did this for a couple, and, sh- and he wrote down, uh, she wrote down 50 bucks, and he wrote down $5,000. <laughs> okay, 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 let's talk about this, you know. This is why we do this exercise, you know. Expectations, you have different relationships to money. But your relationship to, your, to Jesus should change your relationship to your money. You should think differently about it, that it isn't even yours. So if you're a saver, it's telling you that maybe, maybe my God is security and control, functionally. If you're a spender, maybe my God is status and significance, functionally. Now, if you're attaching security, control, status, and significance to money, and someone asks you to give it away, It's hard to give away your significant status, control, and security. That's scary. But if your significant status, control, and security are not in your stuff, but are in Christ, you can never lose that. Now giving becomes a joy. It's not frightening, it's joyful, not fearful. That's why this matters. That's the link for us. These two things are foundational for living a truly generous life. Your security, status, significance, and control are not in your stuff. They're in Jesus. And they're rock solid secure. And you're not the owner anyway. You don't own it. You're stewards, the Bible says. You're like God's money managers. How many of you have ever been to a financial planner? How many of you are a financial planner, right? You go to a financial planner, and after they sell you life insurance, they ask you a bunch of questions. They, they do, they, like, they ask you a series of questions. Like, questions like, what are your plans for your future? What's important to you? What do you want your future to look like? What are your value systems? And then based on how you answer those questions, they put together a plan, a financial plan, to help you get there, to achieve those things. Okay, you and I, rightly understood, the Bible says, are not owners, we are managers of God's resources. He has given you things that he owns to manage, what should we do? We should ask God questions. What's important to you, God? What matters to you, God? Where do you want me to invest what you have given me, God? 
It's a whole different way of thinking about your stuff. And I, I'm not preaching this as somebody who's already there. Let's ask this last question then. What does generosity produce? The phrase Paul uses here is a harvest of righteousness. Now, what does that mean? Some people have used this falsely as like a prosperity gospel thing. Like if I give to God, then he's going to make me rich. It says you'll be rich, enriched in every way. So if I give money to God, like I'm going to get back. Like you mail in the check and the guy with a nice suit on TV tells you you're going to get blessed and you receive money back. That's not what Paul is teaching here. He's saying, we give what God has already given to us, and it produces a harvest of righteousness. What is that? The word righteousness is the word for right relationship. It means what's important to God? People being made right with him, their, their creator. Sinners being, experiencing grace, we say. Finding freedom and forgiveness. Relationships being reconciled on earth. Families being put back together. Freedom from addiction. It means righteousness happening. Seek first, Jesus says, his kingdom and his righteousness, right relationships, vertically and horizontally. We, we talk about shepherd's heart around here. It's not just our food pantry. Shepherd's heart is the umbrella term over benevolent ministry. Uh, there's budgeting teams, job counseling, and food pantry. Aaron Wise, who leads that whole department, regularly tells us stories about people who come to get groceries or to have a utility bill paid. And you know what happens over time? A lot more than that. A harvest of righteousness. People that experience freedom and joy and forgiveness and are now part of the life of the church. That's what matters to God. That's what he's after. That's what generosity produces. So Paul's given us a vision for the harvest and a vision for the Savior. Look at verse 15. Thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. What's the inexpressible gift? What's the inexpressible gift? It's the church answer. You probably can't get this one wrong. Jesus. Think about it. Paul. The whole thing is bound up in the inexpressible gift. The central f- focus of our faith is the radical act of generosity that God so loved that he gave the inexpressible gift of himself to do for you what could be accomplished no other way. Romans 8.32, Paul says, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? We can count on it because we've already received it. Now in verse 9 of chapter 8, 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9, there's a, Paul says, he, he finishes the section I read, it says, for you know the grace of Jesus, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. This is a profound verse. He says, you know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's writing to rich Christians. He's writing to us. And he's saying, you know the grace of Jesus. You know. Do you know? Do you know? Has it penetrated your heart? Paul's appeal is not obligation, it's not duty, it's not guilt, it's grace. You know the grace. You know it. He who had everything in his authority, dominion, and control gave it up and became poor spiritually. Why? So that you, through his poverty at the cross, might become rich in him. For what purpose? To bless others. To be generous. Now, if you find your heart is not generous, perhaps it's because you don't know or have forgotten the grace of Jesus Christ. I, this is a check for me. If I find that I'm slipping into scarcity mentality, I don't have enough, what if I run out, I'm not, sh- I'm not sure if I can pay this bill and I get fearful and anxious and I, it's not, I'm not generous and I know that happens to you, it happens to me. I think it's because I'm slipping and I'm losing sight of, of, of the grace that I've been given. And I'm not talking about being irresponsible, I'm talking about being generous people. So what do you do? Jesus, I'm finished with this, gives us one very profound lesson and it'll lead us to the challenge, your discipline of grace challenge for the week. In, in Luke chapter 12, verse 34, Jesus says something at the end of this parable of the rich fool. He says, for where your treasure is, there your, anybody know? Heart will be also. You know that. Even if you don't know where it comes from, you've heard that before. Where your treasure is, your heart will be. We, we get this. We think, oh, okay, that means that I, I I care about what I invest in. Well, sure. But most of you live as if it works the other way around. 
You live as if I invest in what I care about. Care about my kids, I invest in them. Care about my 401k, I invest in that. Care about my career, I invest in that. Jesus says it the opposite way. He says, where your treasure already is, that's where your heart's leaning, that's where your heart is inclined, that's where you're going. Okay, so what if you find your heart leaning in the wrong direction? It happens to us, doesn't it? What if you find that my heart's leaning the wrong way? I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not generous, but I want to be. What could you do? What could you possibly do? I just don't know. <laughs> now, I know, I know, I can see in your faces. Some of you are like, oh, give. Check your spirit on that. I'm, I'm preaching to myself as much as to you. That's exactly right. Jesus says, you want to care about something? Put your resources there. You want to care about Apple as a company? Buy a bunch of stock. You'll pay attention more than you do now. You want to care about the kingdom of God? You want to care more about the heart and kingdom of God? Invest in it. It's a surefire way to pay attention to it, to care more about it. It's very simple. We just don't want to do it. I don't want to do it sometimes. So here's your challenge for the week, should you choose to accept it. Every day, this week, take a little inventory of your heart in two areas of generosity. Joyfulness and eagerness. Am I joyful and am I eager? Meaning, do I love it and do I want to do more of it? Now, you may not be able to right now because of some issues in your life, but do you feel I, I'm excited about this and I can't wait to find ways to be generous? I'm looking for them. How is your level of joy and eagerness? And then the second challenge is this. Look for someone to be secretly generous to every day this week. Find somewhere this week. Again, I'm not, no, I'm not saying write big checks to the church. Of course, if you did, we would accept them. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm saying look around your life at people that are in need. Do you ever hear stories about people who say, we, needed a, we had a bill for $800 and we couldn't pay it. We prayed and prayed and prayed. And then there was a check in the mail for $801. You ever hear those stories? How does that happen? How does that happen? It's not presto change, oh God makes a check magically appear in the mailbox. It's somebody on the other end of that equation knows about that need or he listens to the spirit of God and is generous. You could be on that end of the equation this week. Look around, pray, God, where can I be secretly generous? Take stock of your joy and your eagerness and then look for ways to be secretly generous and see what God does in your own heart. He wants to set us free from our selfishness and our self-centeredness to experience and walk in his grace. Let's pray. Father God, we humbly thank you that you have given us all things, that all that we could ever need or ask or imagine has been supplied to us in your son, Jesus Christ. Jesus, you are the inexpressible gift. And God, you have lavished your grace on us. Pour it out over us every day. Forgive us for being small-minded, small-hearted, and self-centered. Open our eyes this week to see the reality of our own hearts and to see opportunities with our time and our treasure to be generous to people who are in need. In that way, we reflect your glory and become like you in the world. We thank you, Jesus, and we praise you in your name. Amen.